So we are on the last last book of history. Um, the book of Hester. Esther, not Hester. Esther is a very interesting book, and I'll explain it in just a minute. But basically what happens in the book, um, I'm sure everybody here knows this, uh, a nobody Jewish girl saves her entire nation from a petty nobleman. Uh, you could say this is the uh, oldest biblical Karen. <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, yeah. The guy, not Esther, the, the guy. Uh, uh, not Mordecai, but uh, Haman, that's the guy. The oldest biblical <laughs> Karen. <laughs> so uh, four things to consider about the book of Esther. Um, and let, tonight's lesson's actually very, very short. We're just looking at Esther, and then we're going to introduce the books of poetry. Uh, so four things about Esther. First off, Esther is a very unique book because it doesn't mention God one single time. It gets weirder than that, too. Uh, the second thing, it never once mentions Abraham. The third thing, it never once mentions the covenant that God has with Israel. Never once. The fourth thing, it never mentions, it, ne- it never mentions prayer. It never mentions David's kingship which was kind of like the, the whole thing about the Jewish state. Um, and it is never once quoted in the entirety of the New Testament. Weird, right? I'll give you one weirder, and this is the last, the last little thing to consider from point one. There are no copies that were, that were recovered from the Dead Sea Scrolls. I believe, if somebody knows the answer to this, and I'm, I'm wrong, correct me please, but I believe it is the only Old Testament book that was not recovered in the Dead Sea Scrolls, if I remember correctly, which I'm pretty sure I'm right. But if you, if you find out that I'm wrong, please do, please do let me know. Uh, either way, that's pretty interesting, all those things that it has. Um, it it kind of brings the question, how did, it, how did it not make it into the Dead Sea Scrolls, and how did it make it into the Old Testament Scripture? So I'll get to that in a second. And the second thing to consider about um, Esther is really that the culture of the Persians. The Persians strongly relate to the Western world today, uh, and I don't mean that in all their in all their ways. I'm not saying that at all. But they wanted everything to be inclusive. They they just wanted everybody to just get along, and all beliefs could coexist at the same time. Uh, if they were a driver. They would be that driver that has the coexist sticker on the back that's flipping everybody off. Yeah, that would be, they would be that driver. Uh, uh, and so for Jews, they were seen as unreasonably resistant, uh, unreasonably stubborn, uh, uh, people who were just intolerant, people who just just learned to let well enough alone and drop it. <laughs> and so then you have Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, and Daniel all take place in this culture. And it's funny because they're the ones who are all like, you guys need to, uh, well, I guess that was technically Babylon, but um, in the book of Daniel, uh, you know, the, they're trying to get Daniel to stop praying, but that was actually, technically speaking, that was um, Babylon. But it was similar, a similar nobleman. Um, but still, you know, Esther, they're all trying to kill off the, the Israelites and <laughs> being tolerant. <laughs> and, uh, you know, Nehemiah they're, and Ezra, they're trying to stop the Jews from rebuilding Jerusalem. Being tolerant, <laughs> I just I just find that that's that's funny. But that's kind of the way of it too. I mean, the people who flip you off the hardest usually have coexist stickers on their car. Uh, then the third uh, thing to consider about Esther um, is it's it's really interesting because it explains how the Jewish fist- festival of Purim came to be, um, which is, that's kind of interesting because Purim isn't actually a part of the law. It's a Jewish festival that has nothing to do. Uh, with Moses or Sinai. Uh, and then the fourth uh, thing to consider from the book of Esther, um, the fact that there is lacking, is th- that there might be some lacking proof of Esther shouldn't really concern us for a number of reasons. Number one, uh, there were numerous w- uh, women who the king was sleeping with. The, the fact that he didn't write down Esther specifically shouldn't really concern us. Um, then, uh, which once again, at this point in time, they might have actually recovered some kind of proof of Esther. Uh, but the last time I checked, um, which that research was from the early 2000s, so I, it could be dated by now. Uh, but last I checked, th- there was no no Persian record of Esther. Once again, that shouldn't that shouldn't really concern us um, too much. Why, why would he Why would he mention Esther by name? Why would he do that? Um, 
and then the whole thing that she does. Um, for the Jews, it was a big deal, but in the global aspect of Persia, it likely wasn't something that the Persians lost much sleep over. You know what I mean? So they probably wouldn't have really recorded too much about that. Oh, we were going to kill off these people, and then there was this girl that decided to change her mind. They're, they're not really going to re- mention those kinds of things. Sometimes people look for historical proof where they wouldn't they wouldn't really record those things. You know what I mean? Um, like here's a big one that people get all upset about. There is no record of Israel being in the wandering in the desert. Well, let's just stop and think about that for a second. You have a bunch of nomads who live in tents out in the desert where there's a lot of windstorms. What do you want them to leave behind? Like they didn't build a city out there. They didn't have like Snickers wrappers or something. They it was a bunch of people in tents. Like what do you want from them? Uh, and the fact to to demand you know some kind of historical finding it's just that's just silly. It's just silly. Um, especially when you consider how limited uh, w- we actually find things archaeologically and historically speaking. It's just, it's just silly. So uh, Esther was written sometime around the 400s or the 300s in there. Um, now, the explanation as to why it's not in the Dead Sea Scrolls, this is the one that makes the most sense. It was likely written in the east uh, by the Jews that were in exile that did not go back to Jerusalem, the ones that were still in the diaspora. Uh, is still, you know, spread out the, because there were only a, a, a few that that went back to uh, the Promised Land. Um, so it was probably written there, um, and then it probably didn't even make it into Palestine until sometime after the second century BC, which would mean it wasn't really in the western part of the um, the God's people before the Dead Sea Scrolls were hidden there. So that would kind of fit. Um, besides that, uh, when did it happen? It happened between the, if you remember back in Ezra, it happens between the first and the second return of the exiles. So if you remember, Ezra starts with that first group of Israelites going back, and then around like chapter, I don't know, maybe like six or seven, it has uh, Ezra leading another group, a second group. It happens in between those two groups. Um, so the beginning of Esther is basically in 483 BC. Um, the author, anonymous, they didn't put their name anywhere on it. The main theme. Now, this is, this is the funny thing. I really, I really wrestled with this, um, trying to think of you know an accurate main theme, and I ended up going with somebody else's main theme instead of my own. Uh, and that's that the main theme of Esther is God's sovereignty, which is funny because God's never mentioned in the book, but he's he's kind of like in the in the book of Esther, he's kind of like moving in the shadows. He's you know, kind of doing things behind closed scenes. I think Esther is a great example of God's providence, that he's behind things even though people aren't really talking about him in the story. So as far as an outline of the book, I don't have a real simple a real simple breakdown of it. Um, and the reason for that being is because you don't really have a structure to it like the book of St. Corinthians or Genesis or whatever. Um, it, it doesn't really follow a, a structure. It more follows like a play or a drama. So kind of like Ruth did, you, you've got a problem-solution format. The first like chapter or two just kind of sets up the story, uh, the stage, if you will. And then it, it, it gradually the problem is presented, uh, you, you know, after you have... Um, um, the king being saved from the assassination plot, you have things kind of escalating and then a slow and gradual uh, resolution to the issue. Um, so it kind of just has that format. So you, you, I had a really hard time trying to figure out a basic outline for it. It's more of just think of it as like a, like, like a play where Esther saves the people. And I know that's not as clear as an outline, but it's not really written in that same way as other books. Um, so what does it matter that Esther is in our Bible? So what, right? Well, there, there's a few things that I thought of. The first thing, in bad situations, we can still be used by God for good. Sometimes we think that if we're in a bad situation, there's, you know, oh, we just have to roll on the ground and die. But uh, one thing that kind of, I guess you could say, is the main theme of the book is um, the uncle is talking to Esther, and he says, you know, if, if you choose not to do this, God is still going to, God's people are still going to be redeemed just through some other source. So, now, since you, since you have this opportunity, do with it what you can. I'm, I'm obviously not using his exact wording. Um, you know, use the opportunity as you can. And that's kind of uh, an encouragement for all of us. We're all in crazy days, and we all have opportunities before us. We can roll on the ground and cry and expect somebody else to take care of it. 
and God will raise up other people, or we can allow God to use us um, to do what we can. And sometimes I think we get a little bit upset because maybe our actions aren't as grand as we want them to be. But sometimes it's the little things that act, uh, that ultimately uh, change things. Um, you know, just being a friend to one person doesn't change the whole world, but it changes the world for that one person. Uh, I'm reminded of uh, the fantasy story. I'm a big fan of fantasy, so don't judge me. Uh, the Lord of the Rings, you know, where it's the small people from the Shire who end up saving all of Middle Earth, you know. It's not the big, powerful men from Gondor. It's the small, little men from sh- the Shire. And it's kind of like that um, a lot of times. Esther wasn't anybody really that you'd look at. Tw- I mean, she, she was evidently gorgeous, is what the Bible says. But, I mean, besides that, you, it wasn't somebody who'd say, hey, that's, a, that's an important person there. He was just, just a person. And uh, she did a lot to, to save an entire nation. So, I mean, kind of a big point there. Um, and so, obviously, uh, the second thing that we could say about Esther is that our actions really matter. Um, even without knowing our purpose or hearing from God directly, our actions do still matter. And I think sometimes we kind of get lost in the whole looking for God's will bit of it that we, we forget to just stop and say, hey, yes, God is in control. Yes, God is moving. But yes, our actions do still matter. Um, and I, it's obviously a theme throughout Scripture, but Esther really hammers it in that she had the opportunity to do the right thing or not. And uh, so that takes us to the books of poetry. And uh, we're not really going to look in any of the books specifically. We're just kind of s- going to set it up. Now, uh, I thought it would be interesting to kind of break down how the Hebrew Bible is separated as compared to the English Bible. So, um, obviously, you're familiar with the English Bible. <laughs> I, I hope it's in front of your faces. <laughs> uh, but you've got, you know, in, in, in the English Bible, there's, you know, the books of the law. Then you get to the books of history. And then you get to the books of poetry. And then you get to the, the books of the prophets, major and minor. And that's the Old Testament. Well, the Hebrews did it a lot differently. First off, there's the Torah, which is the law. That's the same. But then the next section is called the former prophets. And that has Joshua and Judges and all that. And it ends at 2 Kings. does not go to Chronicles. ends at 2 Kings. And then you get to what's called the latter prophets. And that goes through all the prophet books that you know, you know, the Isaiah and Jeremiah and all that. But it doesn't have Daniel. Weird, right? And then it gets a little bit, <laughs> it gets a little weirder. They go to from the la- latter prophets. They go to a section that they call just simply the writings, and this has poetry and wisdom. And uh, you have Daniel is in the writings, not in the books of the prophets. And uh, Daniel is after the book of Esther. And then you have Chronicles after Ezra and Nehemiah. At the very tail end, uh, and that's just weird, but I guess that's, <laughs> I mean, I'm not saying, <laughs> you know, whatever, but it's kind of weird, right? You, you look at your Bible, and this is, this is the way it should be ordered, and uh, the Hebrews did not follow our suggestions. So I think if we could build a, a time machine and just kind of go back and have them fix that, uh, probably would be for the best, but, you know, whatever. Um, a little bit about the po- poetical books. The poetical books... Um, use some characteristics we discussed in the class, uh, I guess it was in the fall uh, of last year, like parallelism and chiasm and all that stuff. Uh, it's online if you want a r- briefer or if you just want to kind of read at your own pace. I have some books that could kind of um, help you. Um, the poetic books, which I think is kind of a st- stupid name for them, because or the books of poetry, because they include wisdom literature, um, which, I mean, I guess has poetic elements to it, and it is written in a, fil- a similar uh, standard. But when in our human, in our, not human, in, but in our in our American thinking, when we think of poetry, we think of like songs and that kind of stuff. But a lot of the books of poetry aren't really songs; they're just written in meter. You know what I mean? And so it, it, I don't know. I, I kind of feel like maybe Psalms should just be its own thing, and we should have books of wisdom. But whatever, yeah, whatever. <sighs> yeah, let's do that too. You know, and, you know, we'll fix their order, but then we'll tell them. And if you get some crazy hair about calling it books of poetry, just stop. Just go home and don't do it. <sighs> what are you gonna do? Besides, build the time machine. Um, but uh, the books of poetry are sometimes hard to understand. I would even argue that they're probably the hardest to understand books of the Bible. The books of law are probably hardest to apply to nowadays because there's so many steps. 
you have to understand it then, and then you have to see what the difference is, and then compare it with what Christ changed, and you kind of get to the end product. It's, it's a process, right? But when you get to the books of wisdom, it's not that you don't have to go through, go through a similar process. It's just that it's hard to understand what's actually being said in the book itself. Like Job, which deals with the huge concept of the suffering of the righteous, an age-old question, but it just doesn't give us a, a simple question and answer format. It has like five different people talking, and they all have different views, and it just gets very, very hard. <laughs> About halfway through, you're like, okay, hold on, hold on. Somebody needs to just take a break for a second. And uh, you know, then you have the Psalms, which aren't always easy to understand. I mean, I think it's Psalm 138 or 139 where he's talking about, oh, bl how blessed the person will be that just takes their children and throws them up against the rocks and kills them. I'm like, okay. Okay, buddy. What do you do with that? I, I, oh, boy. You know, it's, 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 it's difficult, uh, but it is, you know, the, the hardness of, of the books of poetry. It's something that you have to struggle with. And I think that's kind of the point of the books of poetry. It's not meant to give you just a simple, easy answer because these are real, this is real life. You know, the real, uh, simple questions don't really fix anything. It more just weighs the, the question itself, uh, which is important. Um, we just, I think, would rather have a simple solution, and the Bible doesn't give us simple solutions. Um, so, well, I, about poetry, it gives us simple solutions about salvation. Jesus. <laughs> uh, so, okay. Uh, but the interesting thing that I've noticed from the books of poetry is even though they're building, they're, they're dealing with these really big concepts that are hard to understand, uh, and this is the very last thing I have for tonight, uh, absolutely none of the answers are flippant and give dismissive, dismissively. None of them. I mean, when you have real people hurting, it, it's easy to think, oh, I've got this. I know how to fix this. I know the answer to this. But the Bible doesn't do that. It says, hey, you know, this person here, they're suffering with why are good people suffering? Let's give you 40 chapters on that. Oh, here's one. What is the meaning of life? I feel old and worn out, and I feel like my whole life's behind me. What do I do with this? Let's give them Ecclesiastes, let to 12 chapters to chew on. <laughs> uh, what about those suffering? Let's give them a whole book of Psalms, like 150 chapters. It's fine. Let them <laughs> stumble through there. <laughs> and uh, none of these answers, none of these answers are dismissive. They're all... Uh, real, they're realistic, and uh, they're helpful, ultimately, uh, which is good. Uh, so next week, we'll look more specifically at the books themselves. Uh, Psalms, Job, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Songs, and uh, I'm missing one. Am I? Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Songs. Maybe that is all of them. No, no, that's in the prophets. Uh, did I have it written down? No, I do not. Well, maybe that's right. Who knows? Any questions about uh, about Esther or the introduction to the poetry? So th that's that's a really good question, but it's not it's not a simple answer. So I'm going to try and make it a simple answer. Um, for a long time, the oldest Old Testament manuscripts we had were called the Masoretic texts, and those were from about a thousand A.D if I'm remembering the name correctly. I think it's called the Masoretic Text. Anyways, uh, I, think, I think it's that one. And so you had these exile, these Jews sh who were in exile, and they had this, the scriptures that at that point they had. It also had the Apocrypha in it too. So like uh, the book of, what was it called? Estrus and um, the Maccabees and all those things. Uh, and uh, so then, you know, when the Dead Sea Scrolls were found, this was a really big find because they were a thousand years older than the oldest manuscripts we had, and they dated before the time of Jesus. This was very significant because a lot of people were saying, oh, they didn't really point forward to the Christ. They were written after Christ has already come. But ha, 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 no, that's not true. We found the Dead Sea Scrolls, and they were from before Jesus, which means that they were not invented after Jesus. And then the second thing, which is very interesting about the Dead Sea Scrolls, is that they very few things were different from the text that we had a thousand years later which means that the text was wonderfully preserved. Now, that's, Esther was in that, but Esther wasn't in the older copies. Make sense? Does that kind of answer that? or Okay. And, yeah. So, I mean, I think it makes sense that Esther wasn't in there because it, you know, it, was, it hadn't come from the east yet, hadn't made it that far over, but it was still read in the uh, Jewish circles in the East, so...
uh, that 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 makes sense to me. I mean, it it could be wrong. Further research in the future will ultimately decide, and further things will be found. But yeah, um, okay. And then, uh, any questions about any of the other books of the Bible? Something you read, maybe that, or something that that we looked at that maybe I didn't do a good job explaining or anything like that. Uh, Lord, thank you for your word. Uh, I just pray you'd help us to always be learners of your word, always showing us new things, Lord. That as we study, you'd meet with us there, and the same Holy Spirit who inspired the scriptures would be the whole, same Holy Spirit who gives uh, revelation to our heart that we'd be able to understand and, and, and discern your word. We love you, Lord. Amen.